Now, it's a year since the glory of the Paralympics, when athletes showcased how much disabled people can achieve. In the run-up to the Games, our award-winning No-Go Britain series looked at the transport problems faced by disabled travellers of a less superhuman hue. Tonight, we return to the issue. In the first part of No-Go Britain, the return, I've been examining how much has changed since the Games. The London Games were memorable in so many ways. Post the goal. It's the golden goal. The great sporting achievements. Disabled athletes becoming household names. It's gold for Great Britain. And the claim this was the most accessible Games ever. And the crowd goes wild. It was a claim we put to the test in our groundbreaking No Go Britain series, which last year harnessed the help of disabled people from around the country. We tested not just transport to the Olympic Stadium, but across the country and the capital. <laughs> yeah, OK, that's not going to happen. Please mind the gap between the train and the platform. As your stories came flooding in, we realised we'd tapped a nerve. From Paralympic superstars forced to throw themselves off trains... I think as a disabled person travelling, you always have an element of fear. ..to teaching assistants left stranded by broken bus ramps. Does this happen often? All the time when I come to Darlington. All the time. With our help, disabled people confronted transport bosses about inferior, inaccessible services. I appreciate the fact that 2015 buses are going to be accessible, but it, the question is, accessible to whom? So a year on, what is the Paralympic legacy for transport users? Have broken ramps been replaced by medal-winning services or are disabled people still being left on the side of the road? Well, perhaps some things never change. In Oxford, 11-year-old Aidan Blake was left feeling angry when a driver in a hurry refused to let him board a bus on a school trip with his classmates. We're about to go on the bus and then the driver pulled up, he opened the doors and then there was a woman with a buggy um, in a wheelchair space which shouldn't be allowed, she should find a buggy space. And the man said that he'll let my classmates on but not me. But this time something was different. Aidan's classmates decided that if he couldn't get on the bus, they wouldn't either. I nearly wanted to cry and um, my friends were like, my friends were like, were almost sort of like protesting, like they didn't want to go on without me. They are like the best classmates ever. They always stick up for me when people are being rude or I'm in trouble. That's what I like about my friends. I'm not somebody that's going to take no for an answer, no way. The bus driver that we met, me and my class, didn't even offer to help. He just sat there. And I thought that was horrible. Aidan has had less horrible experiences on buses since. A spokesman for Stagecoach Oxfordshire said, we are very sorry we let Aidan down. This particular case does not reflect our normal standard of service to customers with disabilities. The driver involved was subject to disciplinary action and has also been retrained. We have issued a reminder to all our staff about the importance of fully following our guidelines on assisting people with disabilities. Across the country, things have started to improve, especially in London. But there's still some way to go, as Michael Hipwell knows only too well. He was a bus driver before he broke his neck in a rugby accident. He still travels by bus, but in South London recently, a driver closed the doors on him, knocking him back onto the pavement before driving off at speed. Well, Michael, what happened to you? Um, when the bus pulled up at a bus stop and the, the driver, when he opened the front door, I asked him if he could put the ramp out. And he looked round and saw a buggy there and says, no, I've got a pushchair, you can't come on. Buggy in the wheelchair space? In the wheelchair space, yes. And I flicked, um, tried to flick my front wheels up onto the ledge so I can speak to him. Um, I just got my foot plate up and I said to him, what, what I normally would do in that situation where how we can both get in, I can get in the space in the buggy in front of me. And he just turned around and said, look, I told you there's a buggy on, on board, you're not getting on. Then I tried to plead again, but he said, I just said it again, I'm not, you're not getting on, and shut the doors. And the doors pushed me back off the off the ledge and then he just drove off without giving me a chance to move away from the bus so it's just a matter of a couple of inches away from the wheels as he, as he just drove off. The driver in Michael's case has been sent for retraining but all new drivers should have already done the course and today TfL have invited Michael in to attend a disability awareness training workshop to see how it's done. What can you do for the passenger in that case so you're not able to allow your passenger to board your bus? 
One of the most common complaints made by disabled people to no-go Britain is that drivers don't intervene when pushchairs take up wheelchair spaces. If you have two pushchairs on your bus and there's a wheelchair user waiting to get on the bus... Here, they're trying to teach the trainee drivers the right approach. Advise them that there will be a bus coming along shortly, give them a rough time of how long it will be. What's your advice to them? Michael offered the benefit of his experience. Why we do don't patronise people is... You know, you know, everyone wants to get on and um, live their life and people like with disabilities the same. When you do that for the first time, it's a bit daunting. This new driver found the session helpful. It's always been a taboo, you know, or I don't know what to say, uh, but now I feel more confident. What, that you will be able to speak in the right way to people yeah. or what? that I'll be able to speak in the right way. Before it was more of a patronising, oh, are you OK? And, but now it's going to be, you know, positive and, you know, ask rather than just assume. And a year on, there are signs of a real Paralympic legacy. An advertising campaign has encouraged people with buggies to make way for wheelchair users. And some tube stations have humps and ramps so disabled people can get on and off. But the fight goes on. There are no plans to make London's new crossrail system 100% accessible. And bus users in Darlington lost their legal battle to get a service they say they're happy with, but they're hoping to appeal. Last year in Wales, we spoke to former head teacher Julie Thomas. She stopped using buses after she went blind, her confidence knocked by a bad experience. No, thank you. Julie still won't take a bus, but the campaign to improve bus access for blind people has gone national. So what are the other issues at the front? You know? It's just basically push chairs and things. Getting... Just as the Olympic torch travelled the country, the Royal National Institute of Blind People is currently on a nationwide bus relay tour. They're demanding better service for travellers with vision impairments. At the start line here in Stoke, passengers and travellers are coming together to swap notes. I'm usually more concerned um, with the bus driver telling me when my stop is. Right. Those, oh, there's the, holes. Those little holes is, is where the driver he has through. Oh, yeah. I never knew that. Yeah. The RNIB has produced a report on the problems, which they plan to deliver to the Transport Minister in London next month, travelling all the way by bus, of course. You can chart their progress online, where we've also been asking you for your stories. Has the Paralympic glow made Britain less no-go for you? And once again, you've been sending us your stories from all over the country. In a repeat of the online experiment we pioneered last year, we asked disabled travellers to tell us about their experiences of travel over the past 24 hours to see what's changed since the 2012 Games. And it's provided an unscientific but revealing snapshot. Many people have been describing the same old problems. Elizabeth Harrison tweeted to share her train travel frustration, saying, ironic, two posters with Paralympians on Norberton Station on a platform only accessible by steps. That's something Norberton deny. Andrew Chatterton told us, boarded a bus via the ramp, but now it won't go in again and the alarm is sounding persistently. Some passengers tweeted photos. Christiana Link sent us this one of the London Underground, explaining both wide gates for exit only and no staff at the ticket gates at Bermondsey. Elsewhere, others complained about unhelpful bus drivers, broken lifts and bumpy footpaths. We've spoken to some of the transport companies involved who tell us they are making progress. And there were lots of good experiences in the mix. Zoe Lee tweeted, Great help from bus driver today in Huddersfield when he lowered bus for my partially sighted son. He also waited for him to be seated before setting off. And Fibro Girl told us, Train staff, lovely. Assistance worked, lovely. Although she added, People using my booked wheelchair space as an overflow luggage store, not lovely. All in all, 59% of you told us about bad experiences, but 41% described positive experiences, far more than our last trial. So it looks as though things are improving. On Friday, we'll be live from the Olympic Park discussing all these issues, the legacy of the Games, your tweets, and whether anything's changed. And remember this... Jelly babies. Socks of bonbons. Mint handbags. Bonbons. bonbons. Love hearts. <laughs> Last year, I met the youngsters with learning disabilities running a sweet shop. Tomorrow, I'll be back with them, looking at the barriers to work faced by disabled people.